Good morning. Thank you, Pastor Ken, for uh, allowing us to be here this morning and inviting us. Um, I've got to let Michael introduce himself to you real quick yes. before we go any further. Okay, thank go you, Mom. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. After seeing your graduation for about your wonderful stadium for Memorial Park, about your going to uh, the graduation party for GGC, and then going down to Costa Rica and then Peru, who will catch a Machu Picchu for catching Indians. About your lady called Marcusa, about your alpaca Spanish learning languages. Your son, Abre, let's mesmerize, and I'll lambature, and about computer doors, Casa. Good job. Casa, let's mesmerize, so she likes apples in English. <laughs> All right. About you, and thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you, Michael. Michael keeps us in line about the order of things, that he has to graduate from high school first, have a massive party for himself. And, uh, and every time we give him the mic, it seems to get a little bit longer, his introduction. <laughs> so we're glad it wrapped it up there. But um, again, I'm Selwyn. This is Lori. In, in, the, uh, in the Cusco region of Peru, there's some famous ancient ruins that many of you have heard of, I'm sure, called uh, Machu Picchu. Uh, Machu Picchu is one of the seven wonders of the world. Uh, it was discovered not too long ago, and because it's one of the wonders of the world, it's a massive tourist trap, and people travel from all over the world to uh, experience it. Right next to Machu Picchu is another famous kind of attraction. It's called the Inca Trail. The Inca Trail runs 26 miles from the jungle areas of Peru to the higher elevations of the Andes Mountains. And uh, to avid hikers, it's considered one of the top five hikes in the world. And again, because of this, people travel from all over the world to go and hike this trail. But beyond the tourist traps and beyond that trail, there are 2.1 million unreached Quechua Indians. These are direct descendants of the Inca, and they have never heard the name of Jesus Christ. And so we are part of a new team that Assemblies of God World Missions is putting together to go into these um, remote areas. They estimate about 400 villages, and we're going to go into these villages, evangelize, disciple, um, with the sole purpose of starting a, a Holy Spirit-led church planning movement um, by the Quechua for the Quechua. Um, I'm going to hand the mic to Lori, and Lori will tell you a little bit about who we are and how we got to this point. Good morning, church. Happy Mother's Day to everyone. <laughs> that video almost made me cry. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to start crying. So, but um, we are so happy to be here with you all today. And we just want to let you know a little bit about us, who we are. Selwyn and I have been married 23 years, and we have two children. We have Courtney, who has gone off and gotten married on us, and she married a military man. And so we moved her down at the end of February after he got his orders to... Fort Benning, Georgia. So they are on their own adventure together. And uh, I'll tell you, because most people don't know, but she's expecting. She's six weeks. So her first baby. So yes, praise God. <laughs> so uh, that's going to be a whole nother world for us. And, um, but then uh, we have our Michael, who was, is going with us to the mission field. And he, has, he was diagnosed with autism at the age of three. And Michael has been with us every step of the way. And he, about three weeks into our itineration last September, he gave us the name Team Peru. So uh, he's all in. And uh, he's, <laughs> he, he, uh, he is all in. So, but six years into our marriage, uh, Selwyn had just gotten out of the military. And he had a really good job. And I was a stay-at-home mom. And we were serving in my hometown of Chickamauga, Georgia. Yes, I'm not from here. <laughs> We've been here 17 years, and the accent is going nowhere, and I'm okay with that. So, <laughs> but, um, but we were serving in my home church, and we were all in, and uh, God put his finger on us and said, I want more from you. So Selwyn and I started praying about what that more looked like. And so we, um, and we came to the determination that God wanted us to go to Bible college. And at the time, the door opened for us to go to Zion Bible College, which was in Barrington, Rhode Island at the time, and is North Point now in Haverhill, Mass. But um, so we did that. Out of obedience to him, we moved to Rhode Island. And the slideshow is going to get a little bit ahead of us, but that's all right. We'll, we'll catch up with it. Um, how many of you have ever had God tell you something that you really wish he didn't? 
That, that was me. Um, I was a, a pastor's kid. I grew up in church. Um, uh, we moved all over the place and all over the world. And, and I loved God, but some of God's people that attend church can be mean. And as a pastor's kid, I had a front row seat to that. I saw a lot of great things, but also enough bad things that I was like, God, I love you, but I will never be a pastor. <laughs> and so when God started saying, hey, start saying, I want something more from you, I got nervous. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. So I, made, I, I thought I made a deal with God. I thought he believed me or heard me, but I told him I would serve him, but only as a missionary. And I, I made it clear that I would not be a pastor. And, and so um, we came up to, uh, to Zion at the time and... Um, and really for the last 18 years of ministry in our lives, it's just been a process of God teaching us to surrender. I really wish I could say that it was something that um, I got and then it was good at, but uh, no, it's just been this daily process. And, uh, and I could speak for hours on this, but I'll, I'll spare you and, and, and condense it. But um, basically while we're at Zion, uh, opportunity came up for a youth pastor position. My dad was teaching at Zion at the time. And he called me up and he said, Selwyn, there's this pastor, he's looking for a youth pastor, and I've recommended quite a few people, and nothing's worked out. He said, but um, he said, what you don't know is I asked God that if he came back to me one more time, whether he wanted me to recommend you. And my dad doesn't recommend his own family, he's just not wired that way. He said, and he came back, and so I think you should look at this. And my response was, nope. As a good, obedient Christian, I said, nope. I said, I'm not a youth pastor, and I have a lot of respect for my father. And he said, Selwyn, I really think you should pay attention to this. And so I said, okay. And in that moment, you know when God speaks directly to your heart? In that moment, when God said to me, Selwyn, for a uh, surrendered life, you have way too much control. And it was kind of a punch in the gut. And um, so I said, all right, God, I'll, I'll go and check this out. And, and we went up to... Um, to Boston, basically, we're in Quincy, just south of Boston, and we're from the country. Like, this is heaven up here where you guys live. <laughs> like, we went to Quincy, which is a city, and I was like, God, we have nothing in common with these kids or with these people, but, um, but God brought us there, and we got hired on. We were there for five years, and, uh, and from that point after that, uh, God called us to go to the mission field in the South Pacific to join my parents. They were living on a very remote island uh, in the country of Vanuatu, which is made up of about 83 islands. These are former cannibals. And where the uh, island that we went to had, hadn't had a missionary on it in 90 years. Um, it was known as the Martyrs Island because that's where they killed so many missionaries. And so um, God told us to head that way and not to raise any, any funds, just to trust God. And so we started going towards it. And the church uh, loved us and got behind us and raised um, some money for us, but not enough. And as we started getting towards it, um, about a month before we were supposed to leave, this... Uh, we had a going away party that someone in the church held for us. And this man came up to us at this party that we didn't know very, very well. And he asked us uh, what we would be doing in the, in the mission field. And so we told him. And he said, well, how are you going to pay for this? And I said, well, without sounding irreverent, that's God's problem. Uh, he told us not to worry, not to raise a dime, and he would take care of it. And that one man put $125,000 in our hands um, over the course of a year. Now, what God's supposed to do is give you that money up front so you can budget it and not stress out. But God never does what he's supposed to do in my book. And so, but this guy just did it like every month. We never knew it was coming in. And we watched God's amazing provision. And so we got to the island and some of these slides here, we literally got to the island in the middle of the night. To get this, to get this island to explain how remote it is, we had to take a, a plane from the capital island um, to this grass runway where the plane would come once a week and land only if the grass runway wasn't wet. And from there we'd get in a boat and we'd go on a two to four hour boat ride, depending on how rough the seas were, around a dormant volcano to the village. When I say village, I mean there's no electricity, no medical, it's bamboo huts, it's, it's remote. We got there, we cut back through the jungle with machetes, we put up tents, and we lived in tents for seven months. And we planted our own farm. And... Uh, and this is where I was finally in the place where I thought God needed me. Uh, serving in some of the units I served with the military, uh, in my arrogance of heart, I thought that the kingdom of God could benefit from my presence in this place. It's true. I didn't tell God that. I wasn't that arrogant. But, but it was in my heart. And I say that for one reason, that God took me to the very place that I was convinced I was strong, and he crushed me there. And he built me. Only God can crush you and build you at the same time. I'm grateful we serve a God that doesn't crush us and leave us there, but he crushes us to get the junk out, much like the drilling at a dentist before he puts a cavity, fills your cavity. 
He gets the junk out so he can build you. I learned so much about surrender. I learned so much about God. And, and we, we were there. We thought we'd be there forever. Had a, had a generator, a satellite phone, and, and, um, and a military-style link-up. And I happened to call Pastor Greg, who was the pastor of the church we had left one day. And uh, when I called him, he said, Selwyn, I just sent you an email. Did you get it? And I said, no. And he said, well, I've just resigned, and I think you're the next senior pastor to come back here. And I said, nope. <laughs> You'd think I'd learn. And he said, well, will you pray about it? Which is really unfair to say to any Christian, because how do you say no? And I really want to say, no, I'm not going to pray about it. But I said, yes, I'll pray about it. So I thought I'd check the box. Oh, you want me to do this? No, okay, just forget about it. And God just wouldn't leave me alone about it. And it was one of those moments where God just kind of spoke to my heart and said, so when your, your worship of me is only as pure as your obedience. Otherwise, it's just empty words. And he used Lori's life, and we get into so many stories here of what it was like and the challenges, but he used my wife's life and said, Lori is not even a camper, and here she is on this island. And, and she's so far out of her comfort zone. But the test of your love for me is where you go where you don't want to go, where you serve me where you don't want to be. And then I had a dream, and I'm not one who has spiritual dreams all the time, but I had a dream on a Christmas Eve where God clearly took us from the jungles there and put us back in the pulpit in Quincy. And I woke up, I said, Lori, I said, God's telling us to go back. I said, but I wouldn't hire me if I were them. I told this church a year ago we were leaving, uh, that we were going here for the rest of our lives. They raised money for us, and now I'm going to tell them God's calling us to come back. They're going to say this guy hears from God all the time, and God can't make up his mind. And so this is not the guy you want leading a church. I said, but I know God's told us to do this. And so I contacted the board, and they sent me an email quit pretty quickly, and they said, are you a missionary or are you a pastor? And I was so frustrated when I got that email, not because it wasn't a legitimate question, because it was. But I remember when I got it, I was like, God, how do you want me to respond to this? And in the moment he said, so when I didn't call you to a title, and I didn't call you to a position, I called you to servanthood. He said, and you'll serve me wherever I tell you, and you tell them that. And I thought, man, that's a good answer. <laughs> Checkmate. Send like how are they gonna respond to that and uh, and they and they didn't respond they just left. and uh, and so we came back to Quincy without the promise of anything and make a long story short God opened the doors and uh, and we were voted in and now I was in the very place that I knew I was weak where I felt overwhelmed um, underqualified and uh, and I spent that first year of of pastoring crying out to God literally saying God I can't do this. And he never came in and said, yes, you can. What he did say is, you're right, you can. And he said, but I can. And, uh, and we watched God do amazing things in that church in the midst of our weaknesses. Amen. Not in the midst of our strengths. In the midst of our weaknesses. And, uh, and for 10 years we passed that church. Our last Sunday there was last August when God all of a sudden, we outgrew the church, moved buildings, and then God said, you're done. And I thought, well, this is not the right time to be done. And uh, God said, this isn't built on you. And, uh, and so God opened the door for us to go to Peru. Uh, Peru was not on our radar screen. And uh, it became personal when uh, we were reading this article in Worldview magazine about a lady named Marcusa. So someone, as you can tell, is the adventurous one. And I don't like change. So God and I have some major conversations when change happens. But, um, and it's all good because I'd rather be obedient than sit in my ways. He said in my ways. So he says to me, he says, aren't you excited? And I said, no. And he goes, oh, why not? I said, because I don't know what to expect. You know, I'd been in Vanuatu when we lived in tents and, came, you know, we're trying to build our house and all these roadblocks and things would happen. And God was like so and said, he was crushing both of us in his own way and our personal walk and together and building us. And he took us to the other side of the world to do that. And, uh, but God was in it, and he, he was good, and he showed us a lot about him and about ourselves. But as we're reading this article, it was about a lady named Marcusa, and then I knew why we needed to go to Peru. Marcusa, two years ago, would come down deathly sick, and she was so ill that um, the only thing that was going to reverse the curse was to get to the local shaman. Because remember, Marcuse is one of the two million who had never heard of the name of Jesus. So she's not going to turn to Jesus. So her husband looks at her one day and says, It's too expensive for us to go to the shaman, so it'd be better for the family, Marcuse, if you would just die. And I was like, you, I was horrified. I had to reread that. I was like, 
In America, we'll go to, you know, the ends of the earth to get our, our loved ones the best care, you know, and spend endless amounts of money. And I couldn't believe someone would say that. So I'm reading on to her story, and about a little while later, um, her husband and her son were at the construction site working. They were five stories up. They both fall, and the husband dies instantly. And the son is crushed some of his bones from his neck down that he's paralyzed, but when he heals, he abandons her. So she tells the interviewer, she says, so I had no one left to take care of the family. A knock on the door a week after her husband's funeral is a gentleman who worked with her husband. And she said, he came into my home and told me, he said, Marcusa, did you know that Jesus loves you and he will never leave you nor forsake you? And she says, there was something in her spirit that received that. And she began to spend time with this man and his family and other Christians in the nearby villages that knew Jesus. And she gave her heart to the Lord. And she looks at the interviewer and she said, and I found my new family and we do life together. And I was just beside myself. I was booing like a baby. I was, I was just crying my eyes out thinking, this is beautiful how God did that for her. And then she says, the last thing she says to the interviewer, as they were going down the mountain, it was getting dark and cold, and she's hollering at them, send more pastors. We need more pastors in our villages. And I told Sylvan, I said, now I know why we have to go. So that's exactly what we're going to do, is we're going to go and disciple Quechuan Indians to be pastors, to rise up and be pastors to the Quechuans so it can be self-sustaining. And they're open right now mm -hmm. to Jesus. So we cover your prayers and your love and your support in, in, in praying for South America as much as we pray for North America because we all need Jesus. So we have magnets and prayer cards on our table, and Michael's going to make sure that each and every one of you have one by the end of the day, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We, we are, um, we're not the answer to the Peruvians' prayers. And we're not what the Quechuan people need, but we do carry the one who is inside of us. And so we don't go there in our strengths. We don't go there thinking, hey, we're going to go and fix everything. We go there in our need and in our weakness, knowing that we're desperate for a powerful God who can use people who just show up. And so, we, like Lori said, we covet your support, um, and we cover um, your prayers, and, uh, and we couldn't do it without you guys. And, and we literally become an extension of, of um, you guys in Peru. So pray for us, and if God enables you to support us, and we appreciate it. Can I pray before I get into this morning's message? I find it amazing that the God who spoke this world into existence wants to speak to each one of us this morning. And I hope you came into this place like understanding that and knowing that and ready to receive. And I just want to pray for that. Lord Jesus, we just come before you. We thank you for your presence. God, we thank you just for this fellowship and for us to be able to come together. Lord God, we thank you that you desire to um, just to, 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 to walk with us and speak to us. And I pray, God, that you would open up our hearts to hear, not from, not from someone, but to hear from you. God, I pray that you would challenge us, God. I pray that you would encourage us, transform us, Lord God. Let us leave this place different than we came in, Lord God. And most importantly, I pray, Lord Jesus, that your name would be glorified this morning and that you would have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the most life-transforming moments in my life came in 2003. I was with a team um, from our church in Quincy on the island that my parents were living in before we'd actually moved down there ourselves. We had taken a team down to go and help them out. And uh, after being there for about a week, we decided to go find this grave of um, a missionary that had been killed 100 years earlier. And I really wasn't ready for what I would encounter that day. It started off as kind of this cool thing to go and do. But I'll never forget the moment I saw that grave. We'd be using machetes to cut back through the jungle, and uh, it was on the side of this hill, and it was overgrown and unkept and, and, and just kind of this headstone that was kind of falling apart, not even a name on it. And I walked up to that tombstone, and, and me and the team, and I just stood there looking at it, and I, and I, and I couldn't say a thing. None of us could. We just sat there in silence, just looking. His name was James Gordon, and James had gone to the island in 1865. He was originally from Nova Scotia. 
And he'd gone to the island because he knew that there were no more missionaries left on that island. They'd been killed a year, early, a year before. And he knew this because the missionaries that had been on that island was his very own brother, George. And George's wife, Ellen. And see, I, I knew this story. And as I'm standing here looking at this grave and, 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 and just looking at it, I, I, this story was replaying over and over and over in my mind. I found myself asking this question, what kind of passion exists in a guy to leave his his country and, 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 and go to the people, not just any people, but the very people that killed his own family and rejected God? What kind of passion exists? And the only answer I could come up with in my mind was simply this, that he recognized the overwhelming need that still existed in the lives of these people, that if he did not come, what chance would they have of finding out about Jesus Christ? I mean, if he he ever had a reason not to go somewhere, right, he had it. I've had missionaries come to the church I pastored, and and if they came up to me and said, Pastor, they just killed my brother, I don't think I should go, I would probably say, Amen, you're right. They had their chance. If they came up to me and said, Hey, they just killed my family, and I'm going to go, I might go, Oh, have you prayed about this? Right? So I'm looking at this, and and all these things are going through my mind, and, 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 and as I'm looking at this, asking these questions, like, who would do this? Jesus came to mind. That's who who would do this. That's who did this. He would leave the the comforts of heaven. He would go to a people that would reject him and eventually kill him for one simple reason, that he knew the overwhelming need that existed in our lives, and if he did not come, what chance would we have? So I'm standing there, and and I'm looking at this, and all these thoughts are going through my mind in complete silence, and and that day I came face-to-face with James Gordon. I came face-to-face with Jesus Christ, and unfortunately, I came face-to-face with somebody else, this guy. Because my life didn't look like theirs. And I had reverend in front of my name. I had pastor in front of my name. I wasn't ready for the sermon I was going to get from a dead missionary. The loudest sermon, the most profound sermon I've ever heard in my life came from a a man who'd been dead over a hundred years, not by what he said, but how he lived. It was in that moment that God said, Selwyn, this is a picture not of what pastoring looks like, not of what a missionary life looks like. He said, Selwyn, this is a picture of what Christianity looks like. This is a picture of surrender. And see, see, when God called me, I said yes to God, but I made it clear to God, right? Where I would serve him, how I would serve him. And I made it even more clear what I wouldn't do for God. And what I said I would do for God and what I wouldn't do for God was all about where my comfort zones were, right? God, some church people can be mean, so I don't know, nope, not doing that. God, my strength is, 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 is the military side and being out in the field, so that's where you can use, that's where I want to be. So God, yes, here's my life, you can have my life, but only within the context of my comfort, and don't you dare call me outside of that. Right? So God says, Selwyn, this is, this is you. He goes, and this is me. We were so far apart. I loved God, loved him, passionately wanted to serve him. Jesus said this in John chapter 12, verses 23 through 24. He's talking to his disciples as he's getting ready to go to the cross, and he says this. He says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, and I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed, but... But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Jesus is talking about wheat as he illustrates this truth. But I want to use corn. I don't think he would mind. He made all of it. I have a single kernel of corn in my hand. Do you know what the potential of this single kernel of corn is? 
This single kernel of corn can reproduce itself 1,600 times. 1,600 times. But it can only do it from this stage right here. But it didn't always look like this, did it? Right? No, once it looked like this. And right now you're going, man, it's warming up. Boil that up, put some butter on that. I know exactly what to do with that. And you could do that, and it would taste good, but the potential of this ear of corn would end at that point. So in this, looking just like this, its productivity level isn't where it needs to be. But looking like this, dead and and, and single, it's on its way to being well productive. So, So what's the process from it looking like this to looking like this? Well, what are these things called? Husks, right? What do they do? See, if I ask that question in Quincy, I don't expect an answer, but I ask it up in New Hampshire. Like, you've got to know, right? Right, it protects, right? It keeps the bugs out. And so what happens is, in order for this to become productive, the sun begins to shine on this, and as the, the sun shines, these outer layers of protection begin to what? They dry out. And as they dry up, they begin to get peeled back, and... I'm going to skip some of the process here and just go, okay, as the sun dries it out, try not to make too much of a mess here, it exposes the kernels and they're juicy. See them? They're soft. And now you're even more hungry looking at this. And this looks good and nice, but still in this process, in this stage, it's still not productive. And as it dries out, it begins to look less like this and more like this. Anybody looking at this and going, man, I'd like to sink my teeth into that. If you are, we'll pray for you, right? No, you've had that unpopped kernel experience in your bag of popcorn. No one appreciates that. To the world, this looks dead. To you and I, this looks dead. Well, this goes, man, we could probably hang that on the fall, and you wouldn't even hang this one because it doesn't even look nice as a decoration. But in God's eyes, it's when it begins to look like this that it is well on its way to being productive. In the world's eyes, it looks dead. In God's eyes, it's begin to live. In the world's eye, this looks alive and juicy and ripe. But in God's eyes, it says, no, there's no way that will reproduce. I love how God's uh, creation speaks and preaches to us. And so it's not until this dries out and, and then a single kernel falls to the ground and, 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 and drops in there and is buried that it becomes productive because this single seed, when it does that, the single seed will produce one plant, and one plant on average produces two ears of corn, and each ear of corn on average produces 800 seeds, 800 kernels. Could you imagine if all of these fell to the ground and produced 1,600? That's almost an entire cornfield from one cob, one ear. Interesting. Jesus goes on, and he says this, the very next verse, he says, The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. Hold on a second, Jesus. You were just given this agricultural lesson. How did you go from like talking about wheat to talking about the man who loves me? Because he wasn't just talking about wheat, was he? He wasn't giving them a farming lesson. He was breaking down. He was saying, hey, I'm going to explain to you how what you're seeing lived out in me. You're going to see me. I am like this wheat. The wheat declares what I have done. The corn declares what I am doing. And I'm declaring to you, what he's saying, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to come. I'm going to die to myself. Picture the Garden of Gethsemane where he says, God, if it be your will, take this from me. But not what I want, but what you have, but your will be done. That's dying to myself. That's coming and saying, hey, this isn't really what I want, but God, if this is what you have for me, then your will be done. He says, listen, that's what I'm going to do, and I'm going to die, and through my death, I'm going to produce. But he wasn't just talking about himself. He was talking to the disciples, and that's why he goes on. He says, listen, the man who loves me won't just say he loves me. His life will look like mine. 
He's saying to the disciples, hey, listen, this isn't just about what I'm going to do, but I'm communicating to you a kingdom-building strategy that I'm leaving with you, and you need to understand that this is how I'm going to take the world. When you live like I live. I look at that and I think, man, Jesus invested for three years into 12 men. And when he needed them the most, they failed him. Right? I mean, right before the cross, I, I've, I've built teams. Um, most, a lot of you guys have built teams in here. How would you feel like that you've built, you've poured yourself into, into these people for three years? And the most critical point, they run away. I'd fire all of them. If I came back from the grave, I'd be like, hey, you're gone. Like, I wasted my time. But Jesus didn't. He comes back from the grave, right, after they failed him at the most critical time. And he says to them, you are still my plan. Although you failed me just days ago, you are still my plan. I'm not firing any of you. In fact, I'm going to take the world with you in the midst of your failure I'm going to use you to take the world. But then he says, but don't you do it by yourself. Stay in Jerusalem. Because you can't. I see what you've done by yourself. I'm paraphrasing. I see what you've done by yourself, and I can't trust my kingdom. But listen, I'm going to use you, but my power, my spirit's going to come, and it's going to, it's going to dwell in you, and you're going to be baptized in it, and it's, you're going to be my witnesses. And he takes 12 people that failed him, and we are here today because of those. And it wasn't just about those. This is not just for them. It's for you and it's for me. This is still his plan. And you are still part of his plan. And I am still part of his plan. And he will still build this. And what he's saying to us is, man, his his strategy for reaching the world is not better sermons from our our pulpits. It's not better worship from from our platforms. It's not more programs from our churches. And those things aren't bad in themselves. But there's one thing that will forcibly advance the kingdom of God faster than anything else. And that is this. If God's people will simply learn to die to themselves and start living for Him. That will forcibly advance the kingdom of God faster than anything else. Guys, I love the church, but it's not your pastor's job to reach everybody. He's here to equip the saints for the work. Can I say something? It's your job. It is, and God's called you to do it, and He's empowered you to do it. And we go, oh, but no, you don't understand me. Look at me, how can I do this? Guys, I wish I could preach this message from a standpoint of looking like this, but I can. I'd be lying to you if I said I didn't have any husks in my life. I have husks. We all do. And so I, I, I'm just a transparent kind of guy. I got nothing to hide. I want to tell you a little bit about my husks. See, see when God Lori t- tell you, you know, she says I get excited, and I, and I do. So God calls us to do something. He says, Someone will use Peru. He's like, someone, are you going to go to Peru? And my first response is, man, golly, I can't wait. This is going to be great. And then I start walking towards what he has for me. And as I walk closer to what he has for me, I begin to realize the cost that he's calling me to. Start realizing, so some of my husks are, God, I'm getting older, and if I go and spend the rest of my life down there, we come back to the States, what will we have? Will I have a house? What will I do for a house? What what will I do for retirement? What about my son's needs and and that? Providing for him. Are any of those things bad things as a father to think about? Absolutely not. But when you hold them before God, they are. When you allow those things to prevent you from moving in obedience, they are. And so what what I want God to do and what he does is often quite different. See, what I, what I want God to do is, is as I walk along and I go, God, what about this house? What about, what about for retirement? Here's what God is supposed to say. He's supposed to say to me, Selwyn, do you remember how I had that one guy give $125,000? Yes, Lord, I remember that. Well, I've got another one of those guys. And they're just waiting for you to get back from the mission field. It's all there waiting for you. Thank you, Lord, you and a cattle on a thousand hills. Praise God. 
That, that's what he's supposed to say. The, the problem is he doesn't say that to me. What he does say to me is this. He says, so when let's talk about your desire for, for this and, and that. And then he says this. He says, so when, what if I don't show up the way you want me to in that area? Will you still go? Hold on, God. That's not what you're supposed to say. See, it's in that moment that I get put in check and I go, who am I going to bow down to? Am I going to bow down to my desire for security? Am I going to bow down to my husks? Or am I going to bow down to my God? Where's my confidence and where's my faith and where's my trust? Is it in these things that I wrap around myself? See, here's the truth, guys. I I love God. I passionately love him, but the truth is I want to serve God looking just like this. That's the truth. That's Selwyn. I want to serve God without it costing me anything. Let me ask you, how many of you want serving God to cost you everything? That would be kind of crazy if we said, yes, that's me, take it all. Right? The truth is, that's us. That's me. I, I, God, I, I love you. I want to serve you, but I, I want to. I want to serve you within the in the context of my safety. If you can just, if you can just show up like this, so so I can feel secure and I can feel comfortable. God, if you just show up, then man, I give you my life. I give everything. And and the problem with it is, it's not scriptural. God says, someone as long as you keep living like this, desiring it. Man, you're not going to produce anything that I have for you. That's why Scripture says the man who wants to save his life, the man who wants to live his life looking like this will lose it. But the man who lives his life looking like that may look dead to the world. It's alive in Christ. And God will produce. Those are my husks. I wish I could say that I get to a point where I say, God, here it is, and, and he takes it, and I, and I bow to him, and, and the husk is gone, but what happens in my life is the next morning, the husk wants to creep back up again. It's not a one-time thing. It's this constant de-husking of life and saying, where's my hope? Where's my security? And the, and the world screams this at us. Isn't it interesting how the world says you can't have enough insurances You can't have enough safety measures. You can't have enough safety nets. It's never enough. You have backup insurances to your insurances, and you have everything. Everything is fear-based. Turn on your TV. It's all fear-based. Have you had this checkup? Have you had that checkup? And Do you have this pain? This could be anything. And, and, And God's like, hey, I'm not against doctors, guys, at all. But, man, I'm just saying. The world screams husk, 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 and God screams, Trust me, those aren't bad things. But when, you, when, it, when they keep you from moving forward with what I have for you, then they become bad things. I have learned that um, I'm far better for God's kingdom in my weakness than I am in my strength. See, when I want God to use me in the midst of my strengths, it's because I feel confident in those things. And when he uses me in my strengths, then I rely on my strengths and I don't really rely on him. When he pulls me out of my comfort zone into the place where I'm convinced that I'm weak, I feel that I recognize there's a greater dependency in my life on him. And here's what I've learned. I know God can do far more in my weaknesses because I've got a death grip on him than I can do for the kingdom and my strength. I'm not saying that God can't use your strengths. He gave them to you. What I'm saying is your confidence doesn't need to be in your strengths. It needs to be in him. Because sometimes he calls you out of your strengths into your weaknesses. I I don't know about you guys, man. I I, want to see people that come into church in wheelchairs, and and, and I want to see us lay hands on them and say, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And I want to see them healed. But if I can't trust God for other things, how can he trust me for that? If I can't trust God to, 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 with, with my house and with my finances, how can I turn around and say, God, I don't trust you to provide for me, but God, I'm going to trust you to heal this person. Can 
And I ask you this morning, what are your husks? I've told you what mine are. I know we all have them. See, husks can look like so many different things. Husks can look like past sins that that God's forgiven us for that we don't forgive ourselves for. Husks can look like abuses committed against us that we now define ourselves by. Husks can look like insecurities. Husks can look like lack of self-esteem. Husks can look like lack of perceived skill sets or strengths that you think you have. It can look like education. It can look like finances. It can look at all of these things that we begin to define ourselves by. We begin to limit ourselves by, God, I, 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 I can't serve you because of this. Or, oh God, when you provide all the finances, then I'll do this. Or, oh God, when you do this, or when you give me the, the vocals so I can sing like that person or the skill set, then I'll do this. And what you're saying to God is when you show up in the context of my safety, then I'll serve you. And God's saying, man, I love you too much to leave you in the context of your safety no, that's not how it works. What I'm telling you to do is to trust me over, you trust, over your trust of your own safety and your own protection. One of the sad things that I get as a pastor, and it doesn't seem sad at the time to the people, but people will come up to me and they'll say, you know, I always thought I would do this for God. And what I say to you, I don't say to them. It would be cruel, right? But I think to myself, that's probably what God had for you but you've been waiting for God to show up within the context of your safety. And that's not how it works. I don't know about you, man. I got one life to live. And spending my life on anything else is just not worth my life. Spending my life on the American dream is not worth my life. Spending it on his is. And I ask you a question, what is that thing that God's called you to? What's that thing that's been on your heart and your mind? What's that thing that if you could do anything for God, what would it be? What's that tug in your heart? And then can I ask you, why hasn't it happened yet? And I really believe you need to answer that question. Not to me, but to, to yourself. And to him. Tell God it's because it's your financial is- is situation. Tell God it's, it, it's, it's because of, of, of your lack of resources or, or your lack of skill set. Tell God it's because you're weak in that area. Tell God it's because of your, your insecurities. Tell God. Tell God all those things. And when you tell God, you need to tell him exactly what it is. Because in that process, you are telling God exactly what this is in your life. You're telling God, this is my husk, and this is why you can't use me, and this is how I define myself. And God wants you to know something. That you are no longer defined by the sins that you committed. You're no longer defined by abuses committed against you. You are no longer defined by your insecurities. You're no longer defined by your perceived weaknesses. You're no longer defined by your strengths. You're no longer defined by your lacks or your gains. You're defined by one thing, the shed blood of Jesus Christ that washes you clean and sets you apart. You're not defined by your failures. If he could take 12 disciples that failed him and use them, I thank God for that picture. Because what he says to us is, listen, it's not about your failures. You can give those to me and I can forgive you. It's about what I can do in the midst of them. And I can empower you and I can send you out and you are still my plan. What he says to us is this. He says, listen, I can do more. He says, I can do more with one Christian that will die to themselves than I can with 800 that come every Sunday to church and faithfully sing and worship God but do not surrender their lives. He goes, give me one. And I can produce 1,600 more than I can do with 800 who come every Sunday. Here's what I know about you. See, you're not here by accident. The Bible says that you were knit together in your mother's wombs. That means that you were defined. He created you. He formed you. He gave you every skill set and everything that you need. And he placed you here now for such a time as this. You are not here by accident. You are not here by mistake. He placed you in your family, whether that was good or bad. He placed you in your jobs. He's placed you in your neighborhoods. He's placed you in this church with purpose for him. 
purpose for him. And you have everything that you need already inside of you to take that next step. And what you don't have, he will give you, but it takes you taking that step. As he said to Joshua, he says, I will give you every place that you place your foot. But there was action required on Joshua's part. He had to step into what God had for him. And God is saying he, he wants you to step into what he has for you. Guys, if you still have a pulse, and if you are still breathing, he is not done with you yet. If he was done with you, you'd be gone. You are his plan right here and right now. It's time we, 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 we quit complaining about our jobs and recognize God placed us there. This doesn't mean that you need to go get a soapbox and stand on it and preach to everyone. Like I said, the, the most profound message I ever heard came from a dead guy. Over a hundred years, without him saying a single word, simply by the way that he lived. Listen, when you live dead as a Christian, and, and you're in your workplace, and, and somebody treats you horribly, and you don't respond by clocking them, you will stand out. And somebody will come up to you and go, I can't believe you didn't give that person a piece of your mind. How can you not do that? And that gives you the opportunity to say, let me tell you about who I once was. Let me tell you about who Jesus is in my life. Before you even opened your word, opened your mouth, this sermon has already been preached by the way that you acted and the way that you lived, and your words will now only confirm your lifestyle. Can I tell you something? This world is hungry. Man, it's a dark place. You know that. They're hungry for something. They're hungry for something real. They're hungry for light. The problem is they don't see it in a lot of Christians. They don't see Christ in the church. They, they, don't, see, they don't see this. They, they, they don't see, see Jesus looks like this, and sometimes they go to church and they see this. And this is talking about this. It just doesn't look the same. But if they start seeing this, they may not even agree with the message right away, but there's going to be something that, that leaps out at their hearts and go, man, I just, this is right. Like, this is what I'm hungry for. I want something real. And God's called me, and, he, and he's called you, and he's called us out of our, our, our imperfections, and, 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 and not because we're the answer, not because we have it all together, but simply because he does. God's placed you here. With purpose. Can I ask you to stand to your feet? And I want to, we're going to do an altar call this morning. And I'm going to ask you, I'm just going to tell you right, I'm going to ask you to come to the front in a, in a couple of moments and, and find a place to pray. I'm a guy that believes God can answer your prayers right where you are in your seat. I know he can. But I believe it's important this morning to come to the front. Here's why I believe it's important. So many times in our lives, the very things that keep us back in our seats from responding to God's are actually husks themselves. God, I want to come forward, but now what will people think? And, and I'm a deacon, or I'm a Sunday school teacher, or, or I'm this, or, or maybe, hey, I've just got too much pride. I don't want to respond. And, and I want to tell you something. God is saying that's the first husk he wants to peel off of you. Because if, if you can't allow God to take that husk off of you in this place, then you will never allow God to take husks off of you outside in the world. I want you to know something. Would you just bow your heads? Just bow your heads and, and close your eyes. God has amazing plans for you. Plans that, 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 that exceed what you can dream of or imagine. And the enemy is whispering all kinds of things into your mind to try and prevent you from walking down the path that God has for you. He's telling you all the reasons why you can't. And all the reasons why God somehow isn't powerful enough to take care of all your inadequacies. And God is standing there with a, a gentle voice whispering, are you going to believe him or are you going to believe me? Are you going to believe the cross in my shed blood or are you going to believe your weaknesses? And so it's this wrestle for, for who are you going to believe? And God says, man, I've created you with divine purpose. He has the same power that raised Christ from the grave, lives and dwells in you. You are no longer a victim. You're no longer defined by these passings. You're defined by his shed blood. And we need to own that in our lives and live that way. With your heads bowed and... What is that thing that God's called you to? 
What is that thing that, 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 that you could do for God if, if it wasn't for all these other things? What is that thing? Maybe another question is simply this. How do you define yourselves? You need to answer those questions before you and God. How do you define yourselves? If you define yourselves by your sins and by abuses and by limitations, you define yourself by husks. And God wants to remove those from you this morning. I'm going to say one more thing before I open up these altars, and that's simply this. You do not have the power to remove your own husks. Only the Holy Spirit can. But you need to name them. I'm going to ask my sister just to begin to play, and, and we're going to go to the Lord, and we're just going to worship Him. But what I want you to do is not respond to someone, but to respond to Him this morning. And you come to these altars, and you say, God, this is my husk. This is how I've defined myself. This is what's been holding me back. And some of you have been defining yourself by this one thing for years, and you can't even imagine what your life is without it. And you name it and say, God, I'm giving it to you. And I can't even, I can't even imagine tomorrow morning not defining myself by this. But Lord, if, if this is from you, will you take this from me? I want to define myself by your love and your power and your authority. God, I, I want to walk in the path that you have for me. And God, I want to experience all that you have for me. I want to be used by you. And God, if you can use me, and Holy Spirit, will you take this husk back from me? And tomorrow morning, it'll probably want to creep up again and you're going to have to give it back to him. But if you will do that, God will remove that husk and God will empower you like you've never experienced before and God will send you out. It doesn't mean you're going to Peru. It might. He's going to use you.